Hey everyone, and welcome to the Philip Show. This is Philip, and I am super excited that you're here. So listen. So normally we grab our coffee, but today it's just far too hot to do that. So I grabbed my mug. Look at this mug, right? It's very Viking. So I grabbed this mug from our friends at uh, Miami Valley Pottery, and I filled it with some cold water <laughs> to offset this fire behind me. Don't 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 talk about my choices. Okay, so now you know this entire month is Pride Month, and The Phillips Show has partnered with Yellow Springs Pride, and we're bringing you inspiring stories of people within and that are allies of the LGBTQ plus community in our efforts to uh, increase uh, awareness, education, advocacy, to shine light on people's lives and their journeys that you may otherwise not know. A lot of times we can create narratives about a group of people, a group of select people, and just create stuff. And a lot of times we may not know exactly what their journey entails and how similar they are to everybody else. And that's what we're gonna do here today. And per usual, I have a fantastic guest for you today. So I'm not going to stand in the way. We're going to talk to her and we're going to get all up in it. So help me to welcome Reverend Daria. Hey. Happy to be here. Oh, so good to see you. All right. So we're here. It's hot. It's Pride <laughs> Month. Oh my goodness. So tell us a little bit about you. Where are you from? What you do? All of the good stuff. Well, I grew up in Yellow Springs, which was an intentional choice by my mom. She wanted me to grow up around all different kinds of people. Mm. And, and I, I'm super thankful for that. And my life has been um, a, quite a journey and I've gone all over the place and I'm back in the area. And luckily, I, I have the great privilege of serving the Presbyterian Church in Yellow Springs, First Presbyterian downtown. Wonderful. First Presbyterian. Now, how long have you been there? I have been um, in person with them for two months before the pandemic started. Oh. <laughs> so about 15 months now. <laughs> a <bit> distant. <laughs> before the pandemic. That was like, what, five years ago? It seems so it long ago. It feels like it. Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. So, so tell us, because this is Pride Month, tell us how you're aligned with the LGBTQ community. Well, I am an out lesbian and um, it was an interesting process going to seminary at a uh, slightly more conservative denominations seminary. But I, um, I feel really blessed to be serving in the church. What was your experience like? Because uh, I'm so interested and I know a lot of people are because you are in the middle of two worlds that at face value seem to be completely opposite. So how did you go from i guess knowing who you are to being called and answering the call to ministry well that's all god's fault <laughs> <laughs> i blame i blame jesus so yeah. i left the church i grew up in the presbyterian church and i left because when i was a teenager i started going so wait a minute so buddhists are going to hell Wait, 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 people are going to hell? What is this? And, um, but I had the example of my grandparents who are Christians in the sense of love one another and do all the good you can and work for justice and help the poor and all of that, which I think is what Jesus was interested in. Um, so I, I had that example, but I just couldn't with organized religion. Okay. And when I was about 30, my wife and I were like, oh, we should probably get the kids into church. We okay. should, this is really common. And so we went back and our church got a new pastor a few years later and his wife taught at the seminary, Lisa Hess. She's amazing. Brian McGuire is her husband. He's fabulous. And um, Brian told me about some um, networks for um gay and lesbian Presbyterians. And I thought, mm -hmm. wow, that's amazing. And then I decided to look at the seminary website to see what kind of cool place would employ such a fantastic person as Lisa and also be a seminary. Sure. And, um, on the website, I saw that they accepted people of all sexual orientations. And I saw a lot of interesting looking people as faculty. And then I kind of got this little nudge going, Hey, I could use you there. 
Wow. And my response was, "Are you insane? <laughs> why did why did you think why did you think are you insane? Like why did why? Well, um, at the time, the Presbyterian Church, the PCUSA, was not ordaining gay people at all. So why would I go to seminary? And so I thought, well, maybe I'm supposed to be an academic and and teach about religion. And I've always been interested in it. Um, so so I thought, well, okay. I'll go visit. They had an Explore United Day. It was United Theological Seminary here in Dayton. And um, I went and the professors gave little mini classes and they had people to talk to you, students about their experiences. And it was just really a great day. And I said, okay, all right, God, if I get accepted, I will apply. And if I get accepted and if I get a scholarship, I will attend. But I went in assuming that, you, that it was to teach. Okay. Right? Okay. But then we did um, contextual education internships. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, well, none of the Methodist churches are probably going to have me unless I lie about who my spouse is. And that's not happening. Mm. Uh, that's kind of counter to what ministers are supposed to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> So um, I asked one of my professors, Lisa Wolf, and she said, well, you should you should find Mike Castle at Cross Creek Church and ask him. And I did. And he was beautifully welcoming and agreed to serve as my mentor for the year. And the church voted to have me come to an internship. And it was it was a great experience. I learned a lot. And I also was like, oh, wow wow, you want me for ministry, God? Because mm. I, that's not what I was expecting. But it it felt very much as though I was being called to ministry in a local church. And and I love that aspect of it. Now, I want to go back um, just a little bit, because by the time that you went into ministry, I think you said you were around 30 when you started making those decisions. Is that correct? I was, I was 30 when we went back to church. I was 35 when I started seminary. Okay, and when did you get married? We got illegally married oh. in 2001. We met in 2001 and like, I don't know, eight months later, we had decided this is this is it for us. It's it's a, whatever, I'm still trying to get to the movies, whatever. <laughs> so we just hit our um, 20th anniversary, but we got married in 2014 in New okay. Jersey where it was legal at the time. And then, you know, with the Supreme Court decision the next year, we were legal, legal. What were your, if you had any, you know, you there's so many barriers and so many hurdles and so mm -hmm. many situations that you're kind of conquering, you know, just being a woman in ministry is one. Right. You know, to know that you would like to go into the ministry after knowing that you had kind of a ill feeling towards church, that's a huge one. And yeah. then to throw the LGBTQ component into the mix is even greater. What would you say gave you, I don't know, the confidence to just see all of these things that could be hurdles and say, you know what, I'm just going to trudge through the marriages. You know, I mean, they're just so many. So how did you just say, you know what, I'm going to do that and I'm going to do that? Well, <clears throat> I think it was largely, I had never heard of the United Church of Christ before okay. I heard of Mike Castle and Cross Creek Community, which was United Church of Christ. And um, I had assumed I would just stay and fight in the PCUSA before okay. I realized I was being called to ordained ministry because I couldn't even serve communion. I could prepare it. Mm -hmm. I could set it up. I could clean up afterwards, but I couldn't serve it in my own church. My wedding announcement couldn't be in our church newsletter. Mm. Our anniversary couldn't be in our church newsletter. Wow. You know, um, we were treated well. We were treated as a family, but there was that hurdle. Mm -hmm. and, and I ended up having to leave the PCUSA, which was really hard for me. I was a fourth generation member of my church mm -hmm. and, and I, had a strong attachment to the denomination and sure. theologically connected, even though I didn't agree with their polity. And um, when I found out about the UCC, which ordained the first openly gay man in 1972. Okay. Um, and, and had been regularly ordaining LGBT people 
for a long time. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, wow, I'm going to have to leave my denomination. But I think that's what I need to do because mm -hmm. I can I can be of service immediately in the UCC. Yeah. And it didn't hurt that the UCC um, has an agreement with the Presbyterian Church that their ministers can serve each other's churches. So I was wow. like, maybe someday down the road, I'll get to be in a Presbyterian church. <laughs> yeah, I am. Wow. Wow. As um, as the minister and those hurdles that we, we just, you know, that you kind of you kind of shattered them right now. Um, there there seems to be a, a huge stigma between being LGBT and finding a church home or or any sort of Christianity, if you will. Yep. You know, how, how, number one, how have you kind of reconciled that? And as a minister, how do you encourage or embrace people that may have questions that maybe you had? You're just like, I just don't feel welcome. I just don't feel like it's for me. I feel like you just kind of throw me away. What, you know, how do you do, how do you handle that? Or like they'll get struck by lightning if they go into a church. Yeah. <laughs> Well, well, you know that. I mean, I have my. I mean, I'll share with I'll share with you um, after you answer that because I mean, I have my own kind of challenges reconciling the belief. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> that's neither here nor there. But go ahead. So um, when I was in seminary, I was thinking, okay, well, if I'm going to be a minister, I better have some answers for people who don't think I should be a minister or sure. allowed to be a Christian because I'm unrepentant, you know. Um. And, and so I did a lot of study and very helpful to me were um, the Soul Force organization, mm -hmm. which is um, online. They have a bunch of great information and the More Light Presbyterians group and the UCC's open and affirming um, group as well, as well as some books. Um, one that I recommend to anyone with questions is a book called What the Bible Really Says About Homosexuality by oh, okay. Daniel Helminiak. And it goes through what we call the clobber passages, um, the pieces that are generally used to condemn homosexuality, uh, non-celibate, I should say, homosexuality. And, um, you know, reading through that, all that information, both online and getting pamphlets and reading books, um, I realized that most of the passages that are usually used to say you can't be gay and Christian weren't actually talking about that. Like Sodom and Gomorrah is a big thing. They yeah. were destroyed because the men of the town wanted to have sex with the angels when they came. Well, actually it's about inhospitality mm -hmm. and it's about treating guests in the city horribly. I mean, there's a really big difference between, you know, what a married couple does and gang rape, which is yeah. what Sodom and Gomorrah is. And, Ezekiel makes it clear and Jesus makes it clear that that story is about inhospitality and hospitality was a crucial, crucial value in biblical times. Sure. I wish it still was quite as crucial, <laughs> but um, so, so that's one. And then, um, I mean, Leviticus, if you wear clothes that are made of two different fabrics or if you you know, plant two different kinds of seeds in the same hole, or if you eat bacon or sausage, then you're violating Leviticus. You know, if you're, if you're around men at all, when you're menstruating, you're violating Leviticus. Um, so that, you know, is, is pretty clearly a set of rules that are meant to set apart a small struggling tribe when they have all this other culture around them. Sure. That, you know, saying different things than what their values are. It was it was meant to make Israel different and mm -hmm. and remind them that they're not like those people. But then people talk about, well, the Old Testament, which I think is kind of a um, demeaning way to refer to the Hebrew Bible. I prefer to say Hebrew scripture or Hebrew Bible. But anyway, people are like, well, that's old and we don't have to follow that. But Paul still says that it's not okay, look at this passage and that passage and that passage. But the Paul passages are often taken out of context. And if you understand the historical context, the literary context and the cultural context of those passages, you can see that Paul is talking about 
A, the power imbalance mm -hmm. in these married men, supposedly heterosexual, having young boys as sex slaves, and in the idolatry involved in temple prostitution, which was the norm in Roman temples, mm -hmm. but very much not the norm, you know, in, yeah. in the Jewish temple. And um, I think that if, if you look at those passages and look what's around them, you see that Paul's talking about something very different than, you know, two women who love each other and want to be married and raise mm -hmm. kids together and have the white picket fence and all that. You know? Yeah. So, so that was really helpful to me. For um, and I think that I think that what you said because a lot of those scriptures that you um, a lot of the scriptures that you referenced are the ones that that are used and mm -hmm. have been studied throughout throughout um, for and against you know right. um, for the um, for the youth who are trying to find their way and you as a minister what role do you feel that the church or Christianity um, plays in the development, number one, of just the generation of youth, but how important is it for youth um, that are LGBT? I think it's really important for youth in general to know that they are deeply loved for who they are, whether they're, you know, straight, cisgender, transgender, um, any kind of queer it's really, really crucial that kids yes. know that they're loved and that they don't have to fit some kind of um, mold that the church has made. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I think the church has done a tremendous amount of damage, has wounded a tremendous amount of people as young people. And, mm -hmm. and I think the church has contributed to the really high suicide rate, mm -hmm. especially for trans teenagers, but also for um, just gay teenagers, lesbian teenagers, bisexual teenagers. I think that we have a lot of culpability and a lot of making up to do. And I think we need to make it very clear to young people that who they are is acceptable and that God loves them so much as mm -hmm. they are. And that we as a church are also going to love them. And I, I think there are a lot of churches that are not there yet. I just had someone reach out to me this morning on Facebook because her nine-year-old son wants to wear a dress and wants to wear makeup. Um, and, and she's told him makeup's not appropriate, but dresses are fine. And, and he, he has older sisters who have given him cast off dresses and, um, they come from a family that's not necessarily so accepting about mm. that. And, and she wanted to know how best to support her son, whoever he is. And I thought, oh, we need more parents who yeah. want to support their children, whoever they are. Mm -hmm. And well, that's a hard thing um, a lot of times for Christian parents to do because yeah. they, they, um, there is this, I don't want to use the word confusion, but ingrained, uh, system mm -hmm. to say you know it's really kind of black or white absolutely you know right. it's it's either this or that you used a phrase and i want to back up mm -hmm. you used a phrase that said you said celibate homosexuality right what is that well that's um you know you, you just don't act on any desire towards somebody of the same sex so so per the church, per the church, per the um, the per, per which church? <laughs> I know I was about to say. I was about to say that's exactly what I was like. Well, not the whole church. Yeah. Stereotypically, yes, because a lot of times people who identify as LGBT, they're oh, they're for the church. You can identify that way, but you can't act on it. That's absolutely right. There are so many churches that say that you know, love the sin, sinner, hate the sin which I think is incredibly reductive <laughs> and yeah. isn't in fact loving. A lot of times when, when people say homosexuality is, is a sin and you're going to hell, <laughs> right? There's nothing that you can do. You know, it's like, are you, are you saying the entire person's going to, are you saying because they're not acting on it because they're celibate, they're okay. Yeah. You know? I mean, and that's what I'm hearing from churches and you know, I, I am in some, clergy groups where pastors are just appalled 
that I would dare to say that my parishioners who are not straight are fine with God. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to swallow. You know, it's hard to mm -hmm. it's hard to wrap your mind around, specifically if you've been indoctrinated and ingrained yes. in in that particular perspective forever, because it kind of permeates our culture. You know, that's the framework where everybody works under that. De not everybody, but the majority, when yep. they deem themselves Christian, you have to believe these things or you're not Christian. It almost takes following Christ out of the way. Yeah. Yep. And, and I think that that's the kind of Christianity that gets the most attention in the mainstream. I think that's the kind of Christianity that people think of when they hear church. They think of, you know, exclusivism and judgment and, mm -hmm. you know, homophobia and, and all of that. And, and I think, you know, church that's a little more progressive has a big, big uphill struggle on our hands to try to say, okay, we have some really bad PR. Let us tell you who we are and show you who we are by our actions, you yeah. know, without, without people just wanting to run away from the church. As a, um, as a pastor, what, um, as a reverend, what have you seen um, is the biggest struggle outside of, um, outside of spirituality? But when, when people come, because a lot of times we have common struggles outside of spirituality. Mm -hmm. So what would you say when you talk about the youth is a common struggle when it comes to teens within the LGBTQ community? I would say not necessarily in the churches I've served, but mm -hmm. churches I've observed, I would say the biggest struggle is, is not being made to feel other and not good by folks in the church. Um, mm -hmm. You know, when I've talked to parents in churches who have younger kids, when I, first was installed at David's church in Kettering, which is my first church that I served. Um, there was a big front page article in the news about me being the first openly lesbian pastor in the Dayton area. Wow. And we had a bunch of people come to our church because they saw that article. They were straight families. The parents were a man and a woman, cisgender, and they wanted to come to a church where they knew their kids would be accepted if they ended up coming out of the closet when they were older. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. We, I mean, we got a few gay couples who would come, some single gay people. But the biggest inflow of people as a result of that article or word of mouth or whatever was straight couples who wanted to make sure that their kids would be welcome in their church, regardless of who they love. That is some forward thinking. Yeah, and 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 way too many churches do not encourage parents to be like that. And actually, right. I didn't meet my father till I was 20. And we had a relationship from when I was 20 to when I was 27. And he started going to this church in Miami, a Pentecostal, what they call Bible believing church. Although I believe my church is pretty Bible believing. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, and he didn't speak to me for seven years. Mm. because the church didn't want them to have anything to do with people who were living sinful lifestyles. Mm. Yeah. And, wow. and it was just the weirdest thing. And, you know, we got through that and, and we got back in touch when I was in seminary, I just kept sending him father's day cards and birthday cards and things like that. And when he heard that I was in seminary, he said that he felt like, God wouldn't have me in seminary if what I was doing by being in love with my wife was a sin. Mm. And so he didn't really talk about that a lot at church, but he came up and we reconnected and he came to my seminary graduation party and acted wow. as a bartender and made really strong mojitos. <laughs> 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 He's Cuban, so he thinks there should be a lot of rum. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. But that's a, that's beautiful because a lot of times, you know, parents don't come around, you know, yeah. a lot of times they, they stay gone. That's right. You know, and, um, and it is unfortunate that more churches um, aren't accepting to be able to comfort or 
navigate with other parents much like you were able to do for those parents at your church. Yeah. Because a lot of times they don't have the wherewithal to even welcome the conversation. That's right. Yeah. You know, it, it, it's not, hmm, it's, it's just against, you know. And it's been so drummed into them, you know, like they want to pray for their kids to change, um, but they don't ever consider that maybe they need to be praying for themselves as well. For a pastor, a reverend, or somebody who's thinking about going into a seminary or who feels called, um, what advice uh, from your world of experience and plethora of knowledge, what advice would you give someone um, today? Well, I would point them toward a denomination that's accepting and, and affirming, not just tolerating. Mm. Um, because I think that's really important to have the backing of your denomination as you enter seminary. And then I would encourage them to, to really learn some self-defense, biblical self-defense before going to seminary, depending on where they go. There are some seminaries like Pacific School of Religion where they're gonna find very many like-minded people. But if they end up going to a Methodist seminary because it's close and they can't afford to leave their job or move away or whatever, um, they're not affirming yet. Mm. Um, and I had, when I was in seminary, I had classmates who were praying for me to find Christ because I had a wife. Wow. Yeah. And, and so what, <laughs> what I did was I learned the biblical self-defense and I would talk about that sometimes, but what I, what I really did and what we did at our church where we couldn't serve as you know, elders or deacons, we couldn't serve in any ordained anything. Yeah. Is we fed people. Mm. And we learned about their families. Wow. Personal connections. And I think, I think that's really important. I think a lot of people either don't know gay people or they don't know that they know gay people. I think it's more of that. Or trans people or bi people or whatever. I think people don't know that they know. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think pretty much everybody knows somebody who's in the queer community. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I think it's just like with race. If you don't hang out with black people and you're a white person, you're going to have really different ideas about who black people might be. Yeah. You know, and it's it's shocking to me that so many people in this country don't have friends who are Muslim. Mm -hmm. don't have mm -hmm. friends who are, you know, different from them really. And I, I really think just connecting with people is, is really important. Wow. Yeah. Connection and, re and building relationship. And I think that you, mm -hmm. you summed it up very well about putting the action, putting the heart into action. And really that is the cause for Christ right there. You know, yep. meeting people where they are, how can I be of service? How can I build a relationship with you? Not stand afar off. Right and then just kind of make up my narrative about you and then go on about my business. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? And even with people who we don't necessarily agree with, I think it's important to make those connections if at all possible. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I've had several people say, I can't believe, you know, you tolerate these uh, conservative people on your page or whatever for Facebook. Um, I have I have friends who will come on and say things and I'm like, <laughs> no, it's it's really not the way you think it is. And yeah. I'll I'll let my friends correct them. But I, I have a lot of progressive friends who are like, wow, I just I couldn't be in relationship with that person. And I'm like, but I have to. Yeah. And I think we all we all should to the best of our ability. You know, I think there's a I think there's a fine line between you know, knowing and communicating with people that are different than us. And then, you know, there's definitely a line. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. Definitely, and being able to be uh, mature enough to understand, you know, where the line is and it's OK to disagree. I think that that yeah. goes a long way because you are very correct. You know, unless we know people that are very different from us, we're always going to have the same mentality and it's going to be a very small box that we yeah. live in. Yeah. Yeah. But I also want to say that I think it's really important that you take care of yourself. And if you know you can't handle the, I kind of want to say spiritual violence mm -hmm. that some people can do inadvertently even. Yeah. You know, people who, who claim to love you and, and think they love you, 
and think they're being loving, mm -hmm. if they're harming you, it's okay yeah. not to be around them. And yeah. I think that's especially important for um, young people who don't fit gender norms. Yeah, especially nowadays where communicating with people is as quick as the touch of a button. Absolutely. You know, so guard your space. Yep. Well, Daria, thank you so much Absolutely. for uh, being here. I um, We could talk all day, <laughs> yeah. we can, but I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for your courage um, yeah. and your example and everything that you're doing to positively impact lives, whoever the lives, whoever owns the life, whoever's life that is. So thank you for that. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> well, good. You're doing well. You're doing well. Thank you for being here. It's been great to be here. Wonderful to be with you. Thank you. So we're super excited. So that's the end of this show, but definitely you can tell that's not going to be the end of my conversations uh, with Dara. She has so much uh, knowledge, but at the end of the day, respect each other, love each other, learn to get to know people that may be a little bit different from you and you'll be surprised at the relationships that you build. And remember, you are the best you in the world and we will see you next time on The Phillips Show. Don't